hasn't lost an ounce of passion. There might still be a little bit of fear in this rivalry, but there is plenty of loathing. At Lambo... Well, I was taking it because I didn't... It wasn't because of the pain, it was because it was more of the buzz. We'll also turn back the clock to the last Packer Golden Boy. Speaking of QBs, did the Bears pick the right one to be their number one? How bad is the Niner news? And what will the absence of number 80 mean to the 49er outfit? And we'll run down the QB casualties from week one. Are they back? Will he bounce back? We'll celebrate the fruits of all their labor next on Prime Monday. too much at the Labor Day barbecue, right? Happy Labor Day. Thanks for joining us with Sterling Sharp and Jill Theismann, Mike Tirico. Welcome to Prime Monday. Mark Malone, Ron Jaworski, Chris Mortensen join us throughout the next 90 minutes. Can't wait to see what the scene is like at Lambeau Field. Get you there in a few minutes. Packers start the defense of their Super Bowl championship. But, of course, the lead story tonight is in San Francisco, and Steve Mariucci's got to be wondering, why me? As he enters his second game as head coach of the 49ers, he'll have to deal with something no Niner coach has faced in the team's last 210 non-strike games. Game plan without the greatest wide receiver in league history. The holder of 13 league records. Jerry Rice, he's out for the season with a knee injury suffered yesterday in Tampa Bay. Mark Schwartz joins us from Niners Camp. He's the greatest receiver in NFL history. His gifts for pass catching, perhaps exceeded only by his remarkable durability. In 12 seasons, Jerry Rice put together a Ripkin-esque run of 189 consecutive games. His teammates have watched him absorb industrial strength punishment with the resiliency of a battery bunny. They have never seen Jerry stay down. He usually bounces right back up and then everybody goes, Whew. When I saw Jerry stay down for more than two or three seconds, I knew he was seriously hurt because Jerry doesn't stay down on the ground. And when he stayed down, didn't pop right back up. I turn and look to a couple guys and go, that's, that's it, he's hurt, um, he's probably done. Of course, a reasonable facsimile of Jerry Rice has yet to be invented. But for the Niners, the depth at his position is particularly bleak. Though he played less than a half, Rice still managed to lead the team with four receptions and with 38 yards, while Terrell Owens and Ihani Owazake combined to catch only three passes, and former first-rounder J.J. Stokes was O for the opener. I think it's a wake-up call to, to not only this team, but this organization and everybody included in it that, you know, everybody's going to have to be held accountable. There will be no Jerry Rice on this football team, or, and I don't think there'll be another one coming around in a, in a long time. Even before Rice went down, Steve Young was again scrambling for survival behind the Niners' patchwork offensive line. On the fifth play of the game, Young sustained a concussion for the third time in 10 months. First of all, it was a mild concussion, much much less severe than the ones he uh, that incurred last year. Um, like today, he's got no memory loss and no headaches. Buried in the rubble of this 49er opener, the fact that newly acquired Kevin Green broke the big toe on his left foot. Now, Green did remain in the game, but is listed as questionable for Sunday's matchup at St. Louis. Even more questionable, the Niners' hopes of 15 consecutive seasons with double-digit victories, especially, Mike, on a diet that won't contain rice. All right, Mark, so recapping, Jerry Rice out four to six months was the initial diagnosis. He undergoes surgery this afternoon, a surgery that may just be wrapping up about this time. It's a torn anterior cruciate ligament and a torn medial collateral ligament, both of those key ligaments in his knee. Torn. Coach Mariucci at his press conference today was asked by the media if he thought Warren Sapp of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers intended to injure Jerry Rice on the play in question. Mariucci said the play was clearly a penalty and it was flagged, but it was not done with intent to injure. Chris Mortensen joins us from Atlanta. Mort, what do the Niners do now? There are some veteran free agent receivers out there. Names like Bill Brooks, Webster Slaughter, or Mark Carrier. Do they go after any of those guys? Well, you know, they can always get one for the minimum, even though they don't have room right now. They can make certain room, certainly. Dwight Clark, the general manager of the 49ers, is not coming out of retirement. I spoke to him a little while ago. 
He told me that Rice just got out of surgery and that the surgery went very well, according to the doctors. They are not going to put Jerry Rice on injured reserve right off. They want to talk to Rice and let Jerry make that decision because he's in such great condition. They're not ruling out a playoff run here. And, you know, Rod Woodson, who's now on the team, came back from an ACL. So they're actually going to keep him active until Jerry makes that decision. Terrell Owens is the key guy here. He moves into Rice's position. J.J. Stokes has to step up, Sterling. Mort, you're exactly right. I think J.J. Stokes is the key in this equation because he's a guy that gets an opportunity now to prove that he was worthy of that first-round draft status. He's in, here's an opportunity. You see him yesterday. Went over yesterday as it was shown in the piece right here. He's got to make that catch. It turned out to be an interception. The one thing he gets an opportunity to do now is make the coaches, players, and the fans feel like he can make up some of that slack and take some of the pressure off Terrell Owens. You know what this whole situation reminds me of? It reminds me of you when you got hurt in Green Bay. You were the man. You were the person that everybody went to. Everybody thought, oh my gosh, what's it going to be like without Sterling Sharp in Green Bay? And it forced Mike Holmgren and Brett Favre to go other places, to force other players to step up and make plays. And I think that's exactly the same situation you're going to see in San Francisco. Now, a lot of other people have got to get up and make some plays. You know, Sterling, it, re it changed that entire football team. I, I wonder if it'll change this one. I tell you the one thing that the Green Bay Packers have that San Francisco doesn't, they had seven months to prepare without me, where Steve <laughs> Mariucci's got about seven days. Seven days right? yeah, sure. <laughs> Less yeah. than that. So as Mariucci tries to put it all together, you know, some folks have asked, Jerry Rice is closing in on the one NFL record he doesn't have, most consecutive games with a catch. It doesn't get affected by his injury. He still sits on 176 until he plays again. Later, more on the Rice injury, and Mark Malone will show us how the Niners adjust without Jerry Rice. Well, the final act in kickoff 97, the opening weekend of the season, takes place in less than 90 minutes at the NFL's most celebrated stadium, Lambeau Field. Tonight, the Green Bay Packers do something that they have not done in 10,486 days. They play a meaningful game as the defending Super Bowl champs. The repeat run begins against their oldest rival, Chicago. Game 154 in the NFL's most played rivalry. Leslie Visser joins us from Lambeau Field. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Mike. Hi, guys. They still miss Sterling Sharp here. Well, welcome to Title Town. How big a game is this? It's like a carnival here. They have bunting. You ought to know that outside the stadium, there is actually a fenced-in area where licensed scalpers are selling tickets to the game. So that means you have about an hour and a half to get a ticket if you think you can get here in time. It's, of course, an important game for both Mike Holmgren and Dave Wanstead. And a little while ago, I spoke to both of them. You took a long time to settle your quarterback question. Is this job Eric Kramer's, or does it depend on if he wins? No, it, it's Eric's job. I mean, Eric uh, is, uh, is our starting quarterback, and we talked about that when he was named quarterback. I think uh, Rick is, is very, uh, he's anxious to play. There's no question about that. We, we'd be kidding ourselves to think otherwise, and he's ready to play. So uh, I think all you got to do is, is look and see what happened yesterday around the league with quarterbacks week number one, and uh, you can never have enough good quarterbacks. That's, I think that's a no-brainer. You're deep, you're healthy. Leroy Butler says you could even go undefeated. How do you assess it? Well, Leroy, as you and I both know, talks a little too much. Uh, but I like the feeling, you know, the feeling on the football team is that uh, we can win every game, and uh, you want that feeling on your team. Now, we all are realistic enough to know there are going to be bumps along the road. But uh, I like the feeling of the football team. We're just not, I don't like him to talk a lot about it. Dave Wanstead says he needs a big game from left end John Theory, who's been bothered by an abdominal pull, but they need his speed and quickness to get to Brett Favre. Well, as for the Packers, both Don Beebe and Seth Joyner are inactive, but other than that, all systems are go. And Mike, I should tell you that Mike Holmgren just told me that Jerry Rice has been very much on his mind and that tomorrow, first thing, he's going to get in touch with his friend and former player. Of course, Mike, back from his days when he was the guy who uh, really was serving the same role Steve Mariucci served under uh, Mike out there in San Francisco. Well, back to tonight's game. The Packers, they have not lost since last November. It's been 18 games since a Packer team lost at Lambeau Field and a long time since Green Bay has lost to the Bears. Look at this dominance. Chicago, they've lost six in a row in this series, and the average score over the stretch, 33 Green Bay, 14 Chicago. Well, Ron Jaworski, as we bring you in from NFL Films, is this Bears team any different from the team that lost last year twice to the Packers? Well, I think it'll be a better offensive team. You know, they've made some uh, changes in their offensive system. Uh, Matt Cavanaugh comes in, and Matt's expertise is in the West Coast offense. And one of the basic premises of the West Coast offense is a quick setup, make your read quickly, and get rid of the football. 
And looking at last year's uh, game tapes of that game in December, the problem the Bears had was their offensive line didn't hold up. Using the West Coast offense, Joe, and the quick passing game, I think will help the Bears. You know, Ronnie, the thing also about Eric Kramer is that last year he only played four games and got hurt. But when you go back to 95, he set a Bears touchdown passing record with 29. So he is very capable of leading this football team. He really lost his job because of injury, and for him to have it is no surprise. And I feel like the football team as a whole will have a lot more confidence, particularly in this game, starting the season, with their incumbent back there, the guy that's led this football team, and done a good job for him. The name of the game tonight, Joe, for the Bears is going to be pressure and how they get it on Brett Favre. The one thing the Bears did last year in the opening game versus the Super Bowl champs in the Dallas Cowboys is pressure Troy Aikman, as you see right here by Alonzo Spellman. He didn't have a way to release that pressure. You see the double safety blitz, they get to Troy. That is something they're going to have to do to Brett, Ford, to Brett Favre tonight. If they can get pressure on him, of course, you know to relieve that pressure. The Packers are going to go to the screen. If they can get that pressure on Brett with their front four and keep him in the pocket, they got a pretty good chance of keeping the score down. Uh, yeah. Not saying they're going to win. <laughs> Keeping the score down. Yeah. In check, possibly. Keeping the score down. Uh, you can, three to four you can now. show us later yeah. how that Packers screen really can do so much damage. We'll you, know, do. you know it's coming. All right, so get ready for that. I'm ready. Okay. While the uh, Jerry Rice injury is continuing to grab all the attention around the National Football League, again this year, week one has brought several significant injuries at the quarterback position. Let's update a couple that happened yesterday. Most serious to John Freeze, the Seahawks quarterback against the Jets. Almost impossible to see how he breaks his thumb on this play. In the end of that blowout loss to New York, Freeze is going to be out four to six weeks. Warren Moon will start in his place. The youngster John Kitna will back up. In San Diego, early indications that Jim Everett could start after Stan Humphrey separated his left shoulder for the third time. And Jacksonville's Rob Johnson will be in a soft cast for a few days after spraining his ankle. Steve Matthews, the last healthy quarterback in Jaguar camp. There's news later on Jacksonville making a move to shore up that position. Chris Mortensen will have that. We'll also have more quarterback news later. Word on Marino, Harbaugh, O'Donnell, and Drew Bledsoe, as well as much more on tonight's game, including a visit with Brett Favre. Tom, let's see if I can make these guys jump. So I'd hand off and I'd do one of these, and the, and the defensive guy, he'd kind of jump. I said, you know what? This may help. Also, the playbook with the Packers pick on Chicago corner Walt Harris, like they did successfully last year. And we're going to look around the league, the headlines from Sunday. Is Michael Irvin back to his old form, and the Cowboys a force to be reckoned with. Much more as we roll on on Labor Day night with more Prime Monday. Racing over to Auto Value. Well, Prime Monday is brought to you by the new Dodge. It's about change by Auto Value Parts Stores. With the parts you want, the value you expect. And by Coca-Cola Classic. Get in on the action. Play Coca-Cola NFL Red Zone. Well, this is one of our favorite parts of the show. Every week at this time, we look back at what we were looking at as we watched the games on Sunday. A little bit of why it happened and what trends are taking form around the league. We're going to start with Chris Mortensen and more few teams as impressive as Dallas yesterday. The Cowboys score over 30 points. They beat Pittsburgh, score in 37. And they go over 30 without an Emmett Smith touchdown. That's never happened in the Emmett era in Big D. Well, maybe we ought to get used to this. I know in visiting with Troy Aikman and Michael Irvin last week, I sensed that something different was going to happen. It's because the Cowboys have a mission statement this year. It's that that offense is going to attack more through the air, probably score more through the air, probably see two more two tight end formations, more three receiver formations. There's a reason for that. Michael Irvin's uh, healthy from our present from the start of the year. Uh, Anthony Miller's there. Billy Davis is there. Uh, Troy Aikman has a lot of confidence in all three of those guys, plus the two tight ends, Eric Bjornsson and David LaFleur. So I think look for Aikman to have his best year yet. Best year has been 23 touchdowns. They think he can go between 25 and 30 touchdowns. 25 and 30 touchdowns, Jaws. You know, Mort, I have always believed the Dallas Cowboy passing game has fueled their football team. Yes, they run the football very well and control the clock, but points come out of the passing game. And if Aikman's performance yesterday is any indication of the season that he potentially could have, it could be a banner year. I love this shot right here. He pump fakes to move the safety to open up Irvin down the sideline for the touchdown. And historically, Troy has not been a great deep ball thrower. I think this is one area he seriously has improved on. And the other thing that I think he's made great strides in is his leadership. 
For a number of years, I always thought that Troy was kind of the quiet guy, unassuming, and was really a leader by example. But the one thing I've noticed about Troy through the offseason and so far in one game is the fact he wants to carry the team himself to the Super Bowl, and with his ability, Joe, I believe he can do it. Well, Ronnie, I, there are really very few questions on the Cowboys' side of the football. I mean, Michael's there, Emmett's there, Troy's there, the line's there, Bjornsson stepped in. They're all given. We expected that. The one thing that I expected yesterday, and I think a lot of people didn't, was that Cordell Stewart is a rookie quarterback in the National Football League. Yes, he's played three years in this game, but he hasn't played the position of quarterback. And this is the first time that somebody has really had the opportunity to game plan against them. Dave Campo and the Dallas Cowboys did a very good job. They made him work real hard. They take him out of what he felt comfortable doing. And for that reason, we have to be patient. I think Cordell's going to be fine. But remember, he really is a rookie, Mike. Steelers. Now, they've got a little bit of a tough game next week, because I thought Washington was impressive. Like you said last week in our season preview, they were good on defense against Carolina. The Panthers losing that game 24-10 in Sterling. The Panthers, a bad preseason, and it really looked like a carryover last night. John Paper said it all year, all preseason, Mike. And it's one thing, penalties and turnovers is killing his football team, but the one thing he was concerned with is their inability to stop the run. And last night, the Washington Redskins lined up with Terry Allen in the eye, seven yards deep, and they did this all night long. He broke arm tackles, he ran through tackles, he ran over people. 90% of the time, though, he ran through wide open holes. John Capers in that zone blitz defensive kick, this people are trying to do too much. If everybody will get back to doing their job, they're going to be fine. I mean, the one thing, you look at this team, Anthony Johnson is starting running back serves on two special teams. Sam Mills, the starting linebacker, anchors one of the special teams. They got quality people. Everybody's got to do their job. You know, one other thing, too, is remember the 46 defense and how dominant it was back? Yeah. And now, and then what people started to do is they started to run the football against it. Once you start running the football against an attacking defense, you really create problems for coaches because now they, they don't have enough people back there to cover. I think Sterling had a key point with the Panthers. You know, it's penalties. They were on the wrong side yeah. of the penalty equation. That hasn't happened to them historically over their oh, short yeah. couple of years. As we continue with more Prime Monday, more on Jerry Rice. With Jerry out for the season, will J.J. Stokes and company be able to pick up the San Francisco slack? And we'll go on the field with the leader of the pack, the reigning MVP of the league, Brett Favre, in the final tune-up for the season. That's awful. Oh, shoot me. I hate to go out like that, but... Off your projects with fantastic savings at Menards. Olympic Overcoat House Paint gives your home a fresh new look. Choose from flat or satin, just $11.77 a gallon after rebate. Build a comfortable home for your pet with Master Halco Kennel Panels. They're easy to assemble. These six by six foot kennels include gate, just $113. Find great deals on all your pet needs at Menards. Save big money at Menards. Devono started five years ago. It was my son's idea to turn our home into an authentic Italian restaurant. Our recipes are passed down to... As we continue on Prime Monday, other key injuries around the league. All three on the defensive side. Daniel Stubbs done for the season in Miami. Blaine Bishop has a plate in his broken arm. He's going to be out at least two weeks with Tennessee. And the cards, Eric Hill, he'll miss at least a month with a broken ankle. And after the win, not all the news good from the Redskins camp. Terry Allen broke his thumb in the second half of their victory over the Panthers. Despite 25 carries for 141 yards, Allen's status for Sunday will be determined later this week. No matter how big that injury is, the biggest injury is to the 49ers. And for more on that, Mark Malone joins us with a couple of our friends. Mark? All right, thanks, Mike. And if you mentioned my friend, Michael Wilbon of the Washington Post, Mitch Album of the Detroit Free Press, and you guys are going to give us your perspective. And I'm going to ask you first, with Rice out of this thing, for the year perhaps, can Steve Young save this team? Well, it's hard to save a team when you're running for your life most of the time, and that's what Steve Young's doing. It's also hard to save a team when you're not sure where you are. This is three concussions in two years for this guy. He's got an offensive line that's breaking down. Look, the quarterbacks were sacked seven times yesterday for San Francisco in the season open. First time that's happened in five years. I just think he's under siege constantly. I don't know how he's going to rally him when he's running back and forth. Well, when you're under siege, you need a bailout guy, and he's lost the greatest bailout guy in the history of the National Football League in Jerry Rice. And, I mean, the, all the routes that Rice would run, all the things that he was handing off on the reverses, so many safety valve things he would do. I think that Jerry Rice's streak of games played, given what he does, the dangerous routes he runs, 
is even more impressive than Cal Ripken's streak, the peril he puts himself in week after week. I think week. he impressed his own team and management because I think they may have made a mistake. I think they may have fallen for the fact that Jerry Rice never gets hurt. So let's keep Steve Young. We'll let Elvis Gerback go, and we'll take one more run at the title while we still got these guys intact. I don't think they ever thought that Rice would get hurt. Now they've lost him. The running attack is still question mark. It was last year as well. I mean, besides a running Steve Young, what really do they have? Well, I mean, they still got a couple of things. One thing that helps them is a week's schedule. They've got that. But the next eight weeks is a steady diet of New Orleans and the Rams and the Falcons. They can stay in contention that way, and they've also got a defense. I mean, people talk about the 49er offense all the time, which is a showpiece, but the defense still has guys like Stubblefield, Bryant Young, uh, Hanks in the back there with Tim McDonald. They can still play They got defense. all that, but it's always been an offensive team that's ahead of the curve, innovative like that. And also, in years past when something like this happened, when Steve Young went down, they had a coach who could say to them, look, guys, we've been through this before. We went to the Super Bowl with me, George Seifert. We went to the Super Bowl with me, Bill Walsh. Now they got a coach who they're looking for for guidance, and they don't know if this guy can get it done either. And players are insecure when they have a new coach. If he blinks in this panic situation here with Rice, it could be all over. Well, given all of this, and I'll start with you, is this team finished, Michael? Uh, probably so. I mean, they can stay in games a lot, but when you lose... When you lose Jerry Rice and Steve Young, it's like the Chicago Bulls losing Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Mm -hmm. You become that team sort of in name only, and that's what the offense has become by losing those guys. I, I would have answered that question before they lost Jerry Rice. I mean, I, I don't think finished like basement, but they were number three in line behind Dallas and Green Bay before, and they may have moved down to number four or five or six now. Well, certainly, this has been considered the weakest division of all for a long time. I think there's been a change of power, Mike, and I think it wouldn't be out of the question at all at this point that St. Louis ends up winning this division. Ooh. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> we will see, and we'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. As we continue on Prime Monday, more on tonight's game and Brett Favre. Later, he talks about his addiction to painkillers, but next, on the field with number four. They're going to jump right here. You know they're going to jump. Everybody hold your water. Green right slot. 9-8 handoff slot on three. Ready? I want a CD player that plays five CDs at one time, but not at the same time. I don't need a VCR with a jog shuttle. I get plenty of exercise. A camcorder with a flying erase head? Can't someone get hurt with that? These answering machines with the little micro cassette? What if you get a really long message? So what's my call us with the things? I'll take two of those. Comes competing for less than a hundred slots. 1580 and his SATs, 4.0 GPA average. Uh, student body president. Hello. 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 No. Uh, Especially important are the teacher recommendations. Uh, I've expressed my concern to Jason's parents about his excessive TV watching. He's been caught skipping school to attend football games. Sounds like a Bristol man. Yeah. Soundtracks is brought to you by Circuit City. Answers in every department. Low prices all over the store. The two Super Bowl champs before Green Bay, Dallas and San Francisco. They both lost in the divisional playoffs the year after they won the title. No kidding, you know this, but there is more pressure and attention on you in the preseason after you add the Lombardi Trophy to the lobby at the team headquarters. Other than the season-ending injury to Edgar Bennett, it was a perfect preseason for the pack. And as we hear in tonight's soundtracks, Brett Favre made sure the fun and regular season enthusiasm was present in last week's last tune-up. That's right. That's right. That's Last one before it's for real. That's right. All right, here we go. We're up. I know we got TV time out. They ain't on TV. The Indubon. 51X spot, flank across. Red left slot, 51X spot, flank across. Someone, right? Blue 58! Blue 58! Wow. That's the way to start off. Green 18! Go. They're gonna jump right here. You know they're gonna jump. Everybody hold your water. Green right slot. 98 handoff slot on three. Ready? Balls, balls, balls. Balls, balls, balls. Balls. Green 18. Green 18. Let's go. Now we gotta get it. Let's go. Let's go. Earl. Johnny. Green 18. Right. Green 18. Put. Green 18. Put. Woo! Gotta love it. Can you believe they passed, Roy? Boss 
Come over, green left, 92 blast on one, right? Blue, 58! Good ball, son. Blue, 58, good, good! Come on now, hey, we gotta use the head. John, come on, you're better than that. Blue, 58, good! Man, man, we should have had that. Come on, Mike. How you doing, man? All right, buddy. How you doing? We were kicking our ass that time. Penalty killed us. Blue 58. Oh. That's awful. Oh, shoot me. I hate to go out like that, but. Well, we'll see how they come back to start the regular season. The Packers open up Monday Night Football season for the first time since 1973. Tonight starts year 28 of Monday Night Football. In year 11 of Al Michaels, Frank Gifford, and Dan Deardorff as a trio. And Dan joins us live from Lambeau. Dan, why don't you weigh in on this? Are the Packers head and shoulders above the rest of the league? Oh, I, head and shoulders might be a little strong, Mike. Uh, uh, I think they're the best team in the league. Uh, based on what Dallas did yesterday at Pittsburgh, I'm not sure the gap between the two of them is as, as big as some people might think. Give me a read on the Bears. I think a team may be searching for an identity. 32 and 32 in the Dave Wanstead era. Is this team progressing or regressing? Well, it's been treading an awful lot of water, and I, and I don't think that's cutting it in Chicago. I, I know that it's not pleasing Dave Wanstead. And remember his quote last year, we were talking with him yesterday. He brought it up himself where he said, you know, last year I said, all the pieces are in place. Well, it appears that the pieces that were in place just weren't good enough pieces. They need an infusion of talent. Whether they got it this year, we're going to find out during the course of 97. But on paper, it doesn't look to me where they've made any giant strides. Let me hop back to the pack. I think their one key question going into this season is the running game without Edgar Bennett. What do you think the impact of that's going to be? Well, the, the, the big, and, and certainly Edgar, a very popular member of this team and a, and a guy who, who didn't put the ball on the ground. And as you know, in November and December here in Green Bay, that's vitally important. But they get a more explosive runner on the field for the majority of time now with Dorsey Levins. He is, he's a quicker, uh, a guy with more of a burst than Edgar Bennett. Uh, where they have problems is depth. If uh, anything happens to Levins, then they don't have that type of quality coming in off the bench. Dan, great to have you with us on the show. We'll see you, Al, Frank, and Swanee at the top of the hour on ABC. Hey, thank you, Mike. What a great place to get started, huh? Oh, terrific atmosphere. We wish we were there. Now, starting yeah. this year, folks, we'll have a trivia question on Prime Monday that will be answered on Monday Night Football. The question, which offensive lineman holds the record for most career yardage? The answer comes up during the ABC Monday Night Football telecast. This trivia question is brought to you by AT&T. It's all within your reach. We'll have the X's and O's of this game coming up. Can the Bears offensive line handle Reggie White and company? We'll explore that question later on. And will the Pack pick on Walt Harris, the Bears quarterback, cornerback? They did it last night, or last year. Will they do it again tonight? The AT&T one-way plan has made long-distance prices simple. It's our honeymoon. Right. Uh, <laughs> Call from home or one more way to anybody in America anytime. I call Pooski every day. And with AT&T? What about those guys who say we can say big over AT&T? Okay, with some, you've got to dial extra digits. And with one, you call it's also got to be at least 20 minutes. I don't want to have to talk for 20 minutes. That's why we... Let's get AT&T one right. You can't talk to me for 20 minutes? No, no. I we never should have said that. No restrictions, no games. The AT&T one rate plan. Sweet dream, baby. Sweet dream, baby. Sweet dream, baby. How long must I sweet dreams from double cheese? You know, I spent years trying to create the perfect club. And yet, with all that's in my garage, the finest example of craftsmanship isn't only on my shelf. It's on my car. Cooper Tires, the one place where performance is more important than on the golf course, is on the road. Cooper Tires, drive on. I thought quarterbacks were the smart ones. That's right. <laughs> 
But it hurts. Another foam shaver. Hey, he didn't know about Edge Pro Jam. New Edge, Reg? This is New Edge Pro Jam. And it's a moisturizing formula, so it protects better than the foam. It doesn't hurt. When I let you get hurt. New Edge Pro Gel. Save your skin. Hey. All right. And now he is beautiful, just like me. <laughs> Saturday, ESPN's ride-along program revs up in Richmond. Jeff Gordon and his crew are running hotter than ever, but Mark Martin is matching him lap for lap. Come along for the ride. The XI NASCAR Select Batteries 400, Saturday at 7.30 on ESPN. Welcome back. Some excellent on this game tonight. The Bears' defense really changing to start this season. Five new starters, two of them in the defensive backfield where veterans Mark Carrier and Donnell Wolford have moved on. Tom Carter is the new starting cornerback next to Walt Harris. Harris made the all-rookie team last year, but as Jaws opens the playbook, he shows us Harris also received a major education from the Packers. You know, Mike, as a player, I can remember getting that, uh, that scouting report every Wednesday. And as I would look at the defense, and if I saw a rookie out there, I would put a big star right by his name. And that would be the player we would attack until he proved himself. In last season's second matchup, the Packers clearly went after Bears corner, Walt Harris. That's Harris at the bottom of your screen. On this second and ten, Harris will read Brett Favre's three-step drop and jump the quick slant. Favre is forced to go to the side where he simply finds Antonio Freeman for a first down completion. But that play was clearly designed to attack Harris, who did have a tendency to play real soft last year. Take a look at the very next play. Again, you see Harris at the bottom of the screen. Right now, he's a good 10 yards off Freeman. That's a soft coverage position all the way. Again, this will be a three-step drop by Favre. As he looks towards Freeman for what appears to be another quick slant. Harris, again reading Favre's drop, again jumps the slant. Not this time. The Packers had him set up for the slant and go. And Favre and Freeman executed perfectly. This is outstanding offense, breaking down an inexperienced corner with a simple yet efficient call. As you can see, Harris is nowhere to be seen. Very next play. Again, the Packers will go after Harris. Hey, that's what you do. Attack that rookie corner. That's just a way of life in the National Football League. When the strong side wideout goes in motion, Harris, here tighter to the offensive formation, will be matched against the tight end, Keith Jackson. You can tell by watching Favre drop back that this play is designed to get the ball to Keith. I mean, Brett is eyeballing Keith all the way. They were going after Harris, and they were not disguising their intentions one bit. Here, Jackson will beat Harris to the corner for the score. Three consecutive plays, Harris was on the hot seat on all of them. It won't be any different tonight. In all due respect to Walt Harris, he played pretty well in his 13 starts. But if you're going to play that aggressive style of play at the corner, you have to get quick pressure on the quarterback. Last year, the Bears only had 30 sacks, which ranked 25th in the NFL. And Joe, I think tonight, uh, Harris is the kind of guy that will be attacked but he's going to need help from Alonzo Spellman. Well, Ronnie, you know, you really point out something when you focus on Walt Harris. Walt Harris last year was the number one target, not of the Green Bay Packers alone, but of every quarterback in the National Football League. He was the guy that they threw the ball at the most. And you'll never guess who the second guy was. It's Tommy Carter, who the, Redskin, who the Redskins let go, and Chicago wound up signing. So what you've got in Chicago's secondary is you've got the number one guy with the target on his back, you got the number two guy with the target on his back. And Sterling, I'm going to go out on a limb here just a little bit. Talk I would practice. guess that, yeah, I would guess that uh, pretty much Brett can go either side he wants right now. And that's exactly what will happen. In this system that Mike Holmgren runs, the one thing he's going to prove to Walt Harris and Tom Carter is the fact that Brett Favre is still hot. Once again, he's going to show that Robert Brooks worked himself to get back in shape. He's going to prove to Walt Harris and Tom Carter that he can do all the things that he did to him last year. The sluggos, the double moves. He's going to do those same things. Walt Harris can't get caught up in looking at people because the system is going to bite him because Keith Jackson isn't there anymore. Mark Shemur is the tight end. And he may even get a shot at Tom Carter and Walt Harris. <laughs> Look out for them sluggos, man. Keep the score down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to watch Robert Brooks on the field tonight. Here's the Packer trainer said in his 21 years in the league, it's the best recovery he's ever seen. If you saw Andrea Kramer's piece on SportsCenter, how hard Brooks has worked, 
Imagine what's going through his mind if he gets set. He did a great job. Tonight. I'll tell you, Mike job. Holmgren is thrilled to have him back there because Robert Brooks drove him absolutely crazy <laughs> during the preseason just to get work. And Mike Holmgren is delighted that this game is here. And Michael rewarded tonight. As we continue on Prime Monday, Chris Mortensen has news on Dan Marino, Jim Harbaugh, and Deion Sanders. And we'll tell you how Neil O'Donnell in one week has already earned himself a bonus. When I started racing, I couldn't be choosy about a sponsor. Now, 25 years later, I only work for the people I believe in. Like Auto Value Parts Stores. When you're ready to bring back that new car. Inside the Numbers is brought to you by Visa, the official card of the NFL. It's everywhere you want to be. www.visa.com Hey, talk about your good debuts. Yesterday, the Giants' Sam Garns returned to Philadelphia interception for a 95-yard touchdown. It was a league record for the longest interception return for touchdown by a player in his first NFL game. But now we're going to go deeper inside the numbers, and once again, here's Mark. Well, Mike, I'll tell you, if week one was any indication of things to come, we're in for an interesting season, to say the least. There's no doubt about it. With all the talk of the zone blitz and defensive dominance, quarterbacks took to the air and lit up the scoreboard in week one. And while last year's cellar dweller flexed their muscle, some favorites to make it to San Diego in Super Bowl 32 served notice. It's all inside the numbers. Redemption was on the minds of the Patriots when they beat the Chargers 41-7. The win represents the largest by a team coming off a Super Bowl loss in 24 years. The Raiders hold the all-time mark by beating the Bills 48-6 on opening day after falling to the Packers in Super Bowl II. When Dallas beat the Steelers by 30 points Sunday, it was the first time in 16 years a road team won by that many points against the playoff team from the previous season. The Jets were among the lowest scoring teams in the NFL last year, but things changed with their 41-3 win in Seattle. It is the largest win in the entire next season by a team that was either winless or had one win the previous year. In their 38-point win, Neil O'Donnell's five touchdown passes tied an NFL record for a season opener. He joins nine quarterbacks who have turned the trick. O'Donnell wasn't the only quarterback piling up numbers on Sunday. Troy Aikman and Drew Bledsoe threw four scoring tosses apiece to mark the first time three quarterbacks have thrown four or more touchdowns on opening weekend. And O'Donnell struck it rich with his five TD performance as part of his restructured contract. O'Donnell accepted a $1 million pay cut with a stipulation he could recoup the money in a bonus if he met one of 15 incentives. One of the 15 incentives was met yesterday when he threw for more total touchdowns than he did all last year, which was four. So he gets a million <laughs> bucks, Mike. Not a bad deal. You don't get a uh, bonus for the incentive, but you get a star on your paper. We saw your name on that five touchdowns <laughs> on opening day list. Modest, you know, this show can use some modesty. <laughs> so it good job, can. Mark. <laughs> oh, it couldn't. Speaking of modesty, here's Chris Mortensen. Hi, Mort. Hey, all right, Mike. <laughs> How are you doing? We're fine. Uh, hey, you have more news. We're talking about Neil O'Donnell on other AFC East quarterbacks. Dan Marino, you made a quick mention as I was watching the end of NFL Countdown yesterday that we could see Craig Erickson on the field by the end of the year. Why don't you clear that up for us? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's really like yesterday, Jimmy Johnson showed he's not going to have a quick hook with Dan Marino. Dan Marino did not play well yesterday in, in the Indianapolis game. But Craig Erickson is going to get more snaps this year than he got last year. Jimmy believes that Craig is ready to play championship football. And Dan Marino is not untouchable. Jimmy feels he needs to win a game by making a quarterback change in a particular game. He will do that. Now, uh, an, a long-term view of this, Erickson is the designated heir apparent to Dan Marino. Pro personnel scouts I've spoken to feel Marino's legs are kind of dead right now. That was a concern for Don Shu after Dan's Achilles tendon injury. So it's certainly a situation you have to watch. People shouldn't be caught by surprise if they see Erickson in a particular game. Still, the Dolphins are 1-0, and there was a story in the Miami paper today about the game yesterday. It said the Colts quarterback, Jim Harbaugh, pulled a uh, Roberto Duran, a no Moss, taking himself out of the game against the Dolphins. You talked to the Colts quarterback in the last couple of hours. Yeah, Jim Harbaugh, I think, is feeling a little bit stung by this uh, criticism. Really, he felt he was being honest. He had been chased around all day by a bunch of young Dolphin defenders. He felt he was physically spent. He went to Lindy and Fonny and said, I want to be honest with you. Paul Justin may give us the best chance to come back from this game, which is quite an admission for a guy who's named Captain Comeback, Mike. I thought it was interesting. He said if it was tennis or golf and I was on there you know, for myself, I'd finish out the game, but I felt I was hurting the team. Interesting yeah. comments from Harbaugh. Lawrence Phillips, what a game yesterday. Career high, 125 yards on his 26 carries. Yeah, you know, Dick Vermeil's done so much to try and build up a trust with Lawrence Phillips. One of the best things he did was bring in one of Ron Jaworski's old teammates, 
Wilbert Montgomery as the running back coach. And Wilbert Montgomery, before yesterday's game, Mike, he put in a note in Lawrence's locker that said, 26 carries, 136 yards. Well, at halftime, Lawrence only had 28 yards on 13 carries. So Wilbert pulled him inside and said, Lawrence, you owe me. And then in the second half, once he started getting rolling, Wilbert Montgomery went to Dick Vermeil and said, keep feeding this guy the football. We have a chance to win him over. And, of course, the result was 125 yards and 26 carries. He only fell 11 yards short. <laughs> Wilbert was pretty close. Taking oh, the yeah. Vegas with us, right? Yeah, Deion yeah. Sanders grounded out as a pinch hitter for the Reds today against Kansas City. Well, yesterday, Deion really turned the heads and impressed his Cowboy teammates. You know, they really didn't know how well Deion was going to play. He, they were amazed by him. They were amazed how he bounced back from that uh, terrible head-turning uh, thing he had in that game. They felt they were able to stop the run because Deion played so well, and you saw the punt return. He said goodbye to them at the airport. See you next week in Arizona. <laughs> Mike, we talked about the Jacksonville quarterback situation. They are bringing in Jim Miller, the ex-Steelers quarterback. They have reached an agreement with him. He'll be their third quarterback in case Johnson gets hurt. Mark Brunel, by the way, wants to play in that Monday night game or wants to be in uniform two weeks away. Uh, Marvin Jones. You know, Bill Parcells shopped him around a little bit before the draft. Now he has reached a trade agreement Marvin Jones has with the Jets on a six-year $15 million deal. $2.8 million signing bonus, Mike. Great start to the season for Dan Green. What thank you as we continue on Prime Monday. Don't say we didn't warn you. Brand new episodes of All That Sucks is Saturday at 8.37, 30 Central on Snick. If we had our way, we'd make every night a Rugrats night. Just yes, rest, kitty. Nickelodeon's all-new animated adventure, A Rugrats Vacation, is now only on video. And Blockbuster is celebrating with the Blockbuster Play Pack. When you rent kids' videos, you can get your very own Play Pack free. Inside, you'll find Rugrats fruit snacks and one of four Rugrats window cleans. You can experience the fun and adventure of the Rugrats, now at Blockbuster. ceramic filled flooring system that strengthens and protects concrete under a wide variety of conditions. But don't confuse floor guard with cheap paints or sealants that flake and peel. Floor guard is a durable, high gloss and seamless flooring system guaranteed for five full years. Floor guard's beautiful, easy to clean surface is available in a variety of colors. Floor guard, the ultimate in concrete protection. Call for a free estimate, 630-231-9070. Nick at Mike now offers a week-long Happy Days Marathon featuring two classic blends. First, Chachinated, robust full-body episodes from the later seasons, Chock Full of Chachi. Then be Chachinated, with all the rich full flavor of the early seasons and none of the Chachi that makes some viewers restless and irritable. Enjoy both classic blends with a Happy Days Marathon, starting September 8th on Nick at Night. Center. It fosters a family atmosphere. Today, we're going to read The Rumble in the Jungle Book. See Muhammad? See George? See Muhammad, Clobber, George? And our children learn skills we don't know how to teach. Yeah, you got to go to the body. And you got to work your left hook. You understand? They're getting nutritious meals. And when your teacher's the reigning WBA champ, you got to listen, which is nice. It's cold out. Don't forget the gloves. Thank you. Well, let's hop back online at ESPN.com. Check into the ESPN Sports Zone. Your questions for Sterling and Joe. First one for Sterling. How do you think Chicago will defend screens and rollouts in tonight's game? That comes from Chris Smith in Harvard Town, Cambridge, Mass. Well, Mike, I think it's interesting. If you want to know how they're going to stop them, I can just revert you back to a Green Bay Packer, Minnesota Viking game to keep you in the division on how to stop the screen pass. What you do is you take your front four and you pressure Brett Favre like John Randall and the guys are doing right here. If you can keep him in the pocket and put pressure, substantial pressure on him to where he has to move his feet around in the pocket and want to bail out of there, it will allow your linebackers to be able to get out ahead of the lineman and get into the screen. What that will do is, is if you make one stop behind the line of scrimmage, Mike Holmgren has a tendency to get away from those. That's something like we've talked about in the past. Disrupt the timing of the whole thing. Yeah. That's one of the ways yeah. everything works. Two ways to stop the pack. All right, Joe, here's your question. It is regarding the Dallas Cowboys. What do you think will have a bigger impact on the Dallas offense, a healthy tight end or the addition of Anthony Miller? That comes from Emil in Kingston, Pennsylvania. 
Emil, I got to be honest with you. I can't pick between either of those. I think that a healthy tight end and the addition of Anthony Miller together will make this offense so much more potent. We talked about Michael Irvin finally having a, a great preseason. Now you see the production of Anthony Miller. He's the guy that Troy Aikman has been looking for since Alvin Harper left. They need the complement opposite Michael so that Michael can work one-on-one -on -one knowing that they can't double him up all the time. And Eric Bjornsson really is their third down crutch. He felt his way into it last year and then finally this year. I mean, he's really starting to produce the numbers that Troy needs. Dallas really kind of got everyone's they attention. They looked good. They yesterday? They look good. You have a chance to drop, like Emil dropped his email. You can uh, drop a line for Sterling or Joe. Their questions on the ESPN Sports Zone. Our web address is ESPN.com, and we'll answer a couple of questions on every Prime Monday. Well, speaking of the Cowboys, they were knocked out by Carolina last year. The other expansion team, Jacksonville, they got just as far as the Panthers in the postseason. But this may be the season the Jaguars earn the headlines first. Mike Wilbon talks Jags in his Prime Monday Minute. Thanks, Mike. It's too late for all you fantasy football geeks to draft Rob Johnson now. But don't feel too bad. Jacksonville keeps slipping talented players past not only rotisserie leaguers, but other NFL scouts as well. It seems while everybody else in the league was whining about the expansion teams getting too many breaks last year, Jaguars officials were busy acquiring people who can play. At the end of last year, we learned about Mark Brunel, Tony Baselli, and Keenan McCardle. This season, it's going to be Tony Bracken, Kevin Hardy, Brian Schwartz, and just maybe Rob Johnson. The cynics can say it was only Baltimore that Jacksonville defeated yesterday. But nobody outside of Tom Coughlin's office predicted that Johnson, regardless of the opponent, could complete 20 of 24 passes, throw two touchdowns, run for another, and twice limp back onto the field like Willis Reed. Now we know why the Jaguars didn't panic and trade any one of their future stars for a journeyman quarterback when Mark Brunel went down. Rob Johnson, who three weeks ago might as well have been Rob Petrie, <laughs> may be the only remedy Jacksonville needs until Brunel gets better. Maybe. Thanks, Mike. Well, you know, the new season began yesterday, and once again, I can't recognize half the teams I'm watching because of their new uniforms. Remember the orange crush of the Denver Broncos? It's the blue crush now, with a red underarm streak that looks like the world's largest perspiration stain. And how about the Tampa Bay Bucks? They dumped their famed creamsicle orange, a perfect color for the tropical Tampa climate, and now they wear some ugly brown shade more suited to a North Dakota rainstorm. The Bucks changed their logo, too. So did the Miami Dolphins. And the Broncos went from the blue D to a horse's head. A horse's head? Hmm. Maybe they'll make a Godfather movie where the guy wakes up with a Denver helmet in his bed. <laughs> Why do teams change colors and logos? Simple. Money. Every time a team goes teal, there's a mob of teenagers who simply must have the new cap, jacket, or jersey. And it's a small fortune. Which is why parents across America are praying that Green Bay stays green. How sad. Once it was a mark of tradition, the teams wore the same outfits as their legends from a golden era. Now there is the golden era, the chartreuse era, and the charcoal gray era. And tradition is as mixed up as a four-year-old's crayon box. Right? And for the record, the new uniforms undefeated yesterday. Ahead, Brett Favre talks about the controversy surrounding his Super Bowl week. Did the league allow him to have a drink? And Chris Berman gets us ready for the Packers-Bears. Days of old set the tone for this great rivalry. Uh, they come from the small cities and big farms, leaving behind their egos and their innocence, bringing only their speed, their dreams, and perhaps a small fire extinguisher. For the sweat and the heat and the pain of Joe Ball, Coors Light salutes the guys of the gridiron, men who know that when you're about to burst into flames, there's only one beer capable of cooling down that burning thirst. Frost Brew Coors Light. Be right back after these messages. You've heard of Nike Air, now there's Zoom Air, the fitness and responsive Nike Air cushioning ever, which means you run faster, just as Jerry Rice and Barry Sanders. Zoom Air helps me to accelerate. Zoom Air helps me make sharper cuts. So trying Nike football shoes with Zoom Air, who knows, maybe you can keep up with these guys. Keep up with me. Keep up with me. Keep up with me. Keep up with me. Hello? I'm the man. I carry cable. I've got my own specialized training methods. 
card, 2.4 pounds heavier than the game card. You can't work the orange, game day. And top plate, you don't work the black. Two areas I'm working on today, coil speed, foot speed. Cable training, people. College football on ESPN2. Game time getting closer. Fans settling in at Lambeau. Eric Kramer, 22 and 20, as an NFL starter, opens the season for the Bears. Let's go back to Green Bay, and once again, here's Leslie. Mike, as you know, Eric Kramer has had a really rough year. He's had to overcome a career-threatening neck injury. Then he had to fight for his job. Well, he says he's still the same guy who led the Bears to the playoffs two years ago. I know I'm the same guy, and I'm, I'm going to go out there and prove it. And I think I'm in, uh, kind of in the time of my career right now. Kramer, who once led the Lions to the NFC Championship, says this job is his, not just because Rick Myra has never played on Monday night. Well, as for the Packers, you might know now that the hottest concepts in coaching are coaches who want total control. Bill Parcells, Dan Reeves, Bobby Ross. Well, Mike Holmgren has expressed interest that someday he'd like to be a GM, and a little while ago, I asked Ron Wolf about it. Ron said that for now, Mike Holmgren is content to be on the sidelines, but that, yes, someday he would like to be a GM, and that he is eminently qualified to do that. Ron Wolf's contract, you might know, extends past the year 2000 to 2003, so it's not imminent here in Green Bay. And when I asked Ron to kind of sum up the relationship they have, Ron said, I get the players, he coaches them. Mike? Well, the formula works right now. Leslie, back to you a little bit later on. And coaching and general managers, that's become kind of a transient part of this league. And you know already of the transient nature of all sports, but specifically, specifically you know, today's NFL players, rivalries, they mean more to the fans these days than to this generation of players. This rivalry is the stuff of legend and books chronicling its history. In the latest book, Mud Bath and Blood Bath, the authors tell the story of Forrest Gregg. Remember him, the former Packer coach? He took this rivalry so seriously, he would not stand for the Packers giving Walter Payton a going-away retirement gift before Payton's final game at Lambeau Field. For more on Bears, Pack to the Monday Night Football Halftime Studio and a man who can speak quite well, Chris Brown. All right, Michael, thank you. A pleasure to be with you for yet another football season. Happy Pigskin, happy Labor Day. You know, if they're going to play the NFL as early as August 31st and September 1st, they've got to give us marquee matchups. Well, Dallas-Pittsburgh, pretty good. Although, if you're a Steeler fan, by the time the gun went off yesterday, you weren't very happy about that matchup, were you? But what's better than the Chicago Bears at the Green Bay Packers at Lambeau Field? You can just imagine either Curly Lambeau or the great Vince Lombardi coaching against George Hallis. You can just see Dick Butkus trying to sack Bart Starr. You can just see Ray Nitschke trying to track down the elusive Gale Sayers. You can just see Don Hudson and Sid Luckman trading scores. These teams are meeting for the 154th time. That's more than anybody else. They have more titles than anyone else. The Packers won their 12th last year. The Bears have nine. They have more Hall of Famers than anyone else. The Bears have 24 and the Packers have 19. But it's really been a one-sided series in the 80s and the 90s. In the 80s, Mike Ditka and the Bears uh, owned the series. They won seven in a row from 85 to 88 including the famous Fridge game. In 1985, William Perry lining up in the backfield, crushing George Cumbie twice on goal line situations, and of course, scoring once himself. That kind of defined the Ditka role. Mike Holmgren's Packers have won six straight against the Chicago Bears to the tune of 200 to 84. And this 90s series was defined with the two games of 95. Monday Night Football, week two, Brett Favre, 99 yard touchdown pass to Robert Brooks as the Pack won. They completed the sweep as far through five touchdown passes to Eric Kramer's two. They each had 300 yards in that game, but the Packers won 35 to 28. And so now they go for their seventh straight win. And you know what, Mike? The only thing Packers fans will like more than a win over their arch rival Chicago Bears tonight is the tailgating they get to do in the parking lot at Lambeau Field. I know I've been there, and my waistline has not recovered. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reason. What will the 49ers do without Jerry Rice? That question's on the docket as we continue. Brett Favre, the winning formula is an old formula. It stupid, and I've had so many guys come to me and say, you know, that's like Harry High School stuff. That was stuff he did back when he was 15 years old. Yeah, but it was. College is expensive. You got tuition, room and board, very old equipment. But one thing's not expensive. 1-800-COLLECT. It saves up to 44%. That's a lot of money. 
I like being in control. With this new Dinner X, I control the cause of my dandruff every day. New Dinner X Advanced Formula. Its medicine doesn't just treat the symptoms, it controls a leading cause of dandruff called Peel Valley. Now that's serious control. New Dinner X Advanced Formula. When Cooper Tire asked me to be their spokesman, I wanted to make sure it was a good match. So I took a tour of one of their factories. I found out that Cooper's been around since 1914, a time of grassroots values that still drives the company today. Hard-working folks dedicated to their craft. My kind of people, always striving to be best. What better match? Cooper Tire. Drive on. Today's professional athlete, revered, respected, but recently tarnished by runners with the law. What explains the rash of athletes and coaches on the wrong side of the justice system? Sports under arrest, outside the lines, tomorrow at 7.30 on ESPN. Since 1995, Brett Favre's record, including the playoffs, has a starter, 29-9. and nine. He's the subject of our first backstage feature of the year, and once again with those, back to Leslie Bishop. Mike, as you know, it's been a very busy year for Brett Favre. He was on the cover of 47 magazines, he got married, and he wrote a searingly honest book about his addiction to Vicodin, in which he admitted that he drank during Super Bowl week. Well, recently I caught up with this most unusual superstar. What is this? That's my candy bar. And do you recommend it? Yes. Let's see, it has your staff on the back. How do you think you do? In 93... What was your completion percentage? Probably about 62%. 60. 60? Yeah. Oh, that's candy bars is wrong. wrong. You think it's wrong? I thought it was like 75. <laughs> I know. That must be a misprint. Oh, yeah. What exactly is that jump pass thing? One day in practice, I was handing off, and I get bored in practice, as I do in, in games and I do in meetings. Half the time, I don't even know what we're doing. So I, I start making up stuff. So I'm out handing off one day, and I say, oh, well, Tom, let's see if I can make these guys jump. So I'd hand off and I'd do one of these and the, and the defensive guy, he'd kind of jump. I said, you know what, this may help. I said, it looks stupid. And I've had so many guys come up to me and say, you know, that's like Harry High School stuff. You know, stuff you did back when you were 15 years old. Said, yeah, but it works. <laughs> Mike Holmgren said he wants you bold, he doesn't want you crazy. Do you think you've matured? Yeah, no. Uh, I, I think uh, to a certain extent I have, uh, but the kid in me I think will always be there, and that will carry on to the field. Uh, you know, I make a, a lot of great decisions, and every once in a while I make a bad decision, but, you know, so what? Who doesn't? He gets red, doesn't he? Oh, he turns red, and he swells a little bit like <laughs> a big bullfrog. He really is great, but um, he has his dark side, too. Talk about the Vicodin you said that. It's kind of a, a nasty mistress like it in that it was very difficult to overcome. Anyone uh, who's been through what I've been through, whether it's biking or, or you know, whatever, you know, their vice may have been, it is difficult to overcome because it becomes a crutch in a way. There came a point in my life where I realized, okay, I don't need this. Because it got to a point where I, I was taking it because I didn't it wasn't because of the pain, it was because it was more of the buzz. I'm kind of hurt, but I don't really need it. Well, what the heck, I can, I can do it, get away with it. And I was playing good, so I said, what the heck. I will not allow myself to be defeated by this challenge. Would you clear up what the confusion was with what your status was in regard to drinking at the Super Bowl and now the way it's been misinterpreted? You know, they were just trying to help, but I thought the way that I was put into the program was a problem. And I went to, to ask for advice and then was put in and subject, subjected to all the fines if, if something would have went wrong. Well, after the Super Bowl, actually, about two weeks before, I received a letter that said, okay, 
feel right. We were wrong in that, okay, you came to us for advice. You were self-referral. But also, I, you know, I realized that I couldn't be walking down Bourbon Street. And I'm like, what, what is he doing? He's not supposed to be doing that. So I, I, I watched what I did. Uh, and in the book, I came out and, and said what I did. You know, so I don't want people to go, oh, my God, he did that? Uh, which was no big deal if I had a couple of beers. So what? They still have your name spelled wrong on the street that you live on? I think so. Every once in a while we get it shot down, so we have to put a new one up. Most people describe you as, though, he's that barefoot boy from the bayou, but how do you define yourself? I don't know. I think I'm a little more complex than, than people give me credit for. But, you know, that's okay. You know, I, I kind of sometimes uh, think of myself as a Terry Bradshaw, you know, where people always thought he was the old, dumb quarterback. But he wins four Super Bowls. He's on TV today. He's been in movies. And he's successful and he's laughing at everybody. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm that way. Brett, too, has a smile on his face. He put on 20 pounds of muscle, and he told me he wouldn't take Vicodin now if he lines it up in front of him. Well, for added incentive and for good luck also, he wears rubber bands on his wrist, a gift from his daughter, Brittany. Josh, I'll see if I can get you one of those candy bars. <laughs> I would love to have one. You know, and I love watching Brett Favre play the quarterback position. You know what, when you watch this guy, he has fun out there. And in studying him, I sometimes you know, like, like want to pull my hair out. But technically, he does so many things wrong. He runs out of the pocket too soon. He, he sets on his back foot and throws the ball. He throws into coverage. He throws across the field. He has all these things that he does wrong. And he's only thrown 110 touchdown passes in three years. Hey, Joe, can you imagine what this guy would be like if he did everything right? Hey, Roddy, you and I did all those things, but we never got the touchdowns. We got the other end of it, all the interceptions. You know what really impresses me so much about him is not his athletic ability, but the strides that he's made mentally in handling the disciplines of what he has to do with the football. Now when he breaks the pocket, he runs around a little bit. Remember when he used to just throw the ball in the air and he used to wind up in some linebacker's stomach? Not anymore. He knows exactly what he wants to do with the football. He mentally, like he said, he gets bored sometimes because he's so bright and he knows exactly what he wants to do with the football. That's where he's made the biggest difference. Mike Holmgren has designed this system when he got with Brett Favre so that Brett can be comfortable. Got with him on the decision making and you got to make good decisions, but I don't care how you get the ball to these open people as long as they get it. He's making good decisions, he's getting the ball to the right people, and the touchdown to interception ratio is the end result. Steve Mariucci had a lot to do with that, Mike. Steve Young, Steve Mariucci had a lot to do. Steve Mariucci had a lot to do with that, Mike. Message? No, just want to let Steve Young know that Steve Mariucci had a lot to do with that. Can I say that? It's, it's been fun. No, he said it enough. <laughs> I want to repeat it, that's all. Ahead, this to replay. The golden boy of Packerland before Brett Favre. A visit with Hall of Famer Paul Hornet. And the future Hall of Famer. No one can replace Jerry Rice, but who will be the guy trying to replace some of the lost catch catches? racing over to Auto Value Park Store to get in on the big sweepstakes excitement going on right now. Whether you love Hawaii or love football or both, take off for Auto Value today. It's your chance to register to win Auto Value Touchdown in Hawaii sweepstakes. Great prizes. A trip for two to the Pro Bowl in Hawaii. Great value. Great prizes. Register now. Auto Value Park Stores. The parts you want. The value you expect. Hey, that's great. But who are the chefs? Not going anywhere for a while? Great googly moogly. Grab a Snickers. You spell it. Yeah. Excuse me, checking out. Uh-huh. We'll change the room. Holiday Inn hotels are undergoing a billion-dollar renovation to make every Holiday Inn as good as the best Holiday Inn. Oh, you're back. Your toothbrush. That means we're changing a lot more than the sheets. Holiday Inn, on the way. 
the best in the business. It's so great to have them. Pancakes, sausage, kick back and watch you guys work yesterday. Nice new digs, too. You like our new set here? Love it. Yeah. NFL countdown, 11.30 a.m. Eastern for 90 minutes every Sunday. Back it up with all the highlights of all the games with Boomer, TJ, and Stuart Scott on NFL Primetime. If you missed the top story in the league today, Jerry Rice is done, likely for the entire season. Two torn ligaments in his knee. Surgery taking place this afternoon. The rehab time from the San Francisco doctors, about four to six months. Mark Malone rejoins us now. Mark, what's the impact going to be on the 49ers offense? I guess the best way I can say it, Mike, is how do you replace the Mona Lisa? This guy is irreplaceable. You know, the players that have been a part of the Niner excellence since their first Super Bowl win in 1981 reads like a who's who's list. But there hasn't been one player that has had an impact on this franchise the way that Jerry Rice has. The question now becomes, where can the Niners turn in this time of trouble? Another San Francisco injury. They've lost Young, and they can't lose Rice. As Jerry Rice crashed to the Houlihan Stadium turf, the ground shook in San Francisco. Rice is a leader in the clubhouse and one of just a few brilliant stars left from a once-crowded galaxy of 49er talent. Without him, San Francisco may be lost in space. J.J. Stokes, the heir apparent to Rice, has struggled miserably, catching only 56 passes and four touchdowns in two-plus seasons. The Niners cannot gravitate to the run either. No San Francisco back has gone over 1,000 yards since 1992 and have yet to recover from the loss of Ricky Waters in 94. Also working against the 49ers is the Big Bang Theory. With the oldest offensive line in the universe and recent multiple concussions, quarterback Steve Young may be one big bang away from a retirement speech. No longer are Steve Bono and Elvis Gerback waiting in the wings. Even with Rice, the Niners have been falling from grace. Super Bowl champs in 94, they missed the conference championship in 95 and managed only a wild card berth last year. Without Rice, San Francisco may slip into a black hole. And if the Niners can't find any new stars and quickly, the season could be a loss. Their next seven games are all against divisional opponents before they meet the Dallas Cowboys on November 2nd. And Mike, this is a team with a lot of pride a lot of tradition. I'm sure that they're going to try to call on that, but the reality of this situation is this team could certainly be 3-5 and five at the halfway point. An eye-opening uh, day yesterday for the 49ers. Mark Banks, as Prime Monday continues, much more on the game. Dave Craig, the Bears offensive line, keep them upright against the Packers as Mike Holmgren and Dave Wanstead get to go against one another in the season opener of 1997, coming up on ABC at the top of the app. Javono started five years ago. It was my son's idea to turn our home into an authentic Italian restaurant. Our recipes are passed down through generations. And all of our sauces are simmered six hours till they reach perfection. Our customers are recommended by other customers. And when they arrive, they are treated like special guests in our own home. Visit us and you'll see what I mean. Stop tracking dust and dirt into your home. Protect and beautify your garage floor with FloorGuard. FloorGuard is a decorative ceramic filter. Remember, Eric Kramer is the starting quarterback for the Bears, and Brian Cox is the guy in the middle. The linebacker missed the last seven games last year with a broken left thumb. Let's go back to Lambeau and Leslie. Mike, I think you're trying to talk to me. It's awfully loud here. It's very exciting at Lambeau. Well, Mike, as you know, it's really tough to exploit the Packers defense. They gave up the fewest points in the league last year. What the Bear coaches have seen, what they know, is that Leroy Butler likes to come on a single blitz. Now, if that appears to be the case, look for the Bears to go deep to Ricky Prohl, possibly on the first play of the game. They know they have to strike quickly to have any chance here at Lambeau. Mike? Okay, Leslie, they're getting ready to unfurl the championship banner in Green Bay, so an exciting night for the Packer fans. Well, after winning a Super Bowl, Brett Favre is an author. He has new endorsements and business opportunities. He's the latest golden boy of the green and gold path across troubles and triumphs quite similar to the path of the past packer, Paul Hornick. The Hall of Famer who seemingly saw it all, was in the middle of it all, and on the field, did it all. Paul Hornick is tonight's distant replay. There are many 
football legends in Green Bay, but none quite like Paul Horn. He was good looking, had a great personality. Everybody liked him, men liked him, women loved him. I mean, it was a case of this is a, this is a, your American hero. He was the golden boy, a Heisman Trophy winner at Notre Dame, a handsome bachelor who earned more in endorsements than he did playing football. But Horning was more than a pretty face. He was a rugged 220-pound back who Vince Lombardi called the finest competitor he ever coached. Horning was the key to Green Bay's power sweep, either running with the ball or throwing a block to clear a path for fullback Jim Taylor. He's one of the greatest football players, I thought, all around football players because he can run, he could block, and he could catch the ball, he could throw the ball, and he could kick. He could do all those things to Bishop. Horning set a league record by scoring 176 points in the 1960 season. He scored 15 touchdowns and kicked 15 field goals in a 12-game regular season. But Horning was just as busy off the field, enjoying life as football's most eligible bachelor. He had, he certainly had very strong leadership qualities off the football field. <laughs> Come on, Earl, quit laughing, man. Quit laughing. The broads that he brought in. The, the broads that he brought in, that's the name of the game. You do your job on the field, and if, if you're bad on the field, and you be bad off the field with the chicks, all right? Horning found a kindred spirit in teammate Max McGee. I had to meet the team in Winston, Salem, North or South Carolina, wherever that is. <laughs> I said, where's this Horning? That's number one. At that time, they called him the bonus choice at those times. I said, where is he at? He said, go over there in that room. I go in there, and here's a big poker game. Hog Hanner, Horning, Forrester. I said, that's for me. So I got in the game, and we were roommates from then on. Vince Abadi was real thick with our training camp, and we had, to, we had to come in every night. We'd have meetings, we'd have dinner, then meetings, and then curfew. And uh, so the guys wanted a night out. And Vince said, you're here for football. That was it. No night off. So one day when they found out Vince was going to be a bed check, doing a bed check, I heard that. They heard him coming down the hall, and Max McGee and Paul Hoyne were roommates. And they took off all the clothes, climbed the bed together. When Vince opened the door, they were in there hugging. <laughs> I don't know how true it is, but I heard that Vince took one look, stepped back, closed the door, and then, at the next meeting, he announced we were going to have Wednesday nights off. <laughs> he took me aside once. He said, look, he said, you're one of the highest paid players in this football team. You make a lot of money in radio and TV commercials and the other thing. He said, I can get on your ass. He said, because I know you can handle that. And he said, first of all, you need it. You need me getting on your butt because I think that makes you a better football player. But most importantly, you're one of the top guys. So the rest of the team is saying, well, he plays no favorites. Commissioner Pete Rozelle showed no favoritism in 1963 when he suspended Horning and Detroit's Alex Karras for betting on NFL games. I know what I did was wrong. I didn't realize at the time that it was that serious. I never bet against my team. We never, uh, if I bet against the Packers in those days, I would have lost anyway because uh, we, we beat the number so many times it was ridiculous. Uh, the toughest part, I called him because I, I knew it was going to, something could leak out quickly. And I wanted to talk to him on the phone and try to explain as best I could what I, did, what, what I was going to have to do and why. And uh, his mother, Loretta, answered the phone. Paul was gone. And that, that hurt. I almost choked up talking to her. There's a danger there if you're down and you're losing money and you're a player like Horning who kicks, scored touchdowns, kick gets the points and field goals and got passes and things like that. If you get down and start owing money to people, they would come to you and suggest that you might have something to do with the outcome of the game. Horning was reinstated in 1964. A year away had dulled his skills, except when it came to the big games. What I will always remember most about Paul was what a clutch performer he was. The bigger, the, the greater the pressure, the more he wanted the ball. In the 1965 championship game, Horning slogged through the mud for 105 yards and the clinching touchdown. It was perhaps the Golden Boys' finest moment. Once you retire from professional football, you look back on those years as the greatest years of your life. You can never recapture the moment 
When you're standing in Lambeau Field and you scored a touchdown and those fans are behind you, that's something special. That's a special time in your life. Distant Replay is brought to you by the new Dodge. It's about change. One of the proud guys for the Packers title from last year. There's Edgar Bennett, the torn Achilles, so he's on the sidelines watching, meaning the rushing load will be carried by Dorsey Levins as the Packers get set to open the season against the Bears. To help you get around in Dodge Caravan, we devised a seating chart. We put the back seats on wheels, so they roll in and out. They fold flat, they recline, or they can be replaced by a pair of captain's chairs. So if you want Caravan to fit the way you live, feel free to rearrange the furniture. Dodge Caravan. Now get up to $1,000 cash back during the Dodge Big Summer Clearance. I like being in control. With this new Dinner X, I control the cause of my dandruff every day. New Dinner X Advanced Formula. Its medicine doesn't just treat the symptoms, it controls the leading cause of dandruff called Peel Valley. Now that's serious control. New Dinner X Advanced Formula. Alex Denardi. He's already clinched the points championship. Now, he's out to make history. Competition is fierce at Bristol University with... Monday Night Football tomorrow, Reggie White is on up with Chris Myers, as you know. Reggie wrestled this summer against former NFL Steve McMichael. I don't know if this is going to come up in the uh, line of questioning, but Reggie White up close, Chris Myers, tomorrow at 6 Eastern, right before SportsCenter on ESPN. Matt Cavanaugh, who was the 49ers quarterback coach last year, as we told you before, he's replaced Ron Turner as the Bears' offensive coordinator. That means more of an emphasis on the short passing, the West Coast offense. Can that help mask one of the Bears' biggest weak spots, the offensive line? As Jaws opens the playbook, not only does he look professorial, he shows us <laughs> the problems with Chicago up front. You know, first of all, I'm a little scared watching Reggie throw those quarterbacks around. You know, could be a little bit scary. You know, but Mike, when I when I look at uh, that game last December between the Packers and the Bears, one thing jumped out at me. The Bears used a lot of uh, you know maximum protection, keeping the backs in to, to help the quarterback out, and that showed me a real lack of confidence in the offensive line. A key matchup in tonight's game features Bears left tackle Andy Heck, here against the Arizona Cardinals in the preseason. He'll be matched against defensive end Gabe Wilkins, who the Packer coaches feel can be a better player than Sean Jones. My film study showed that Heck struggled in the preseason. Here's just one example. He will not use his hands well, not punching them out to create some distance between himself and the end. Instead, he leans forward, losing balance and leverage. This allows the end to use the swim move to work to the inside with little resistance from Heck. You see that Heck has lost position and is beaten. Last season's December matchup holds the form. You will see the Bears use a lot of quick drops. That's because they're overmatched along their offensive line. That will put the burden on guards Todd Perry and Todd Berger. Perry is the one to watch here, matched against the Cardinals' Eric Swan. Against the Packers, he'll be looking at Gilbert Brown and Santana Dotson. That will be tough duty. On this three-step drop by Kramer, Perry will not set properly. Look at his face. His feet are way too wide. Plus, he's not aggressive. He receives the blow by Swan rather than attacking at the snap. Remember, this is a quick three-step drop, and this ball is out of Kramer's hand in a second and a half, and he still doesn't have time to set and throw. You know, as a quarterback, when you have this type of quick pressure in your face, you lose your focus downfield, and you almost perceive the pressure coming, even if it's not there, and you dump the ball off to try to sustain offense. And this, this style of offense is not conducive to beating the Packers' defense. Hey, Sterling, they only allowed the fewest first downs in the NFL last year. Well, the key to Chicago, Johnson, they got to stay out of those long, obvious passing situations. But Leslie touched on one thing tonight. Offensive coordinator Matt Cavanaugh said they're going to take their shots, and they're going to take their shots early. So that first pass may be a bomb to one of those two wide receivers to flip the football field, create some field position. Also, they're going to get their backs out. The fullback tonight for the Chicago Bears should catch between six and ten passes because he's going to be able to sneak out into the flat, create a passing lane for Eric to get rid of the football. I don't know how much yardage they're going to get, but at least Eric Kramer won't have to take a beating. And the other thing is, the reason why he may not have to take the beating is that the Green Bay Packers defensively and Fritz Shermer, their coordinator, don't necessarily like to get their linebackers involved in putting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. They rely predominantly on those four guys up front 
and allow Leroy Butler to jump up there and get his particular amount of sacks in. They also, I think the Bears on the other side, have a chance to control that front a little bit by running a little play action pass. It's the best form of protection you can get. It will allow that fullback out into the, into the flat and allow the, the Bears to be able to move the football down the field. You know, Ronnie, I really like, I think, what the Chicago Bears are going to try to do on offense as we've described it. You know, Joe, they tried last year in the game that I studied to do the maximum protection. And as we know as quarterbacks that study film all the time, uh, uh, the best way to get maximum protection is play action. That didn't work last year. And I don't know how it's going to work this year, Sterling. Well, Josh, they got to keep the score down, but they also got to keep Santana Dodson and Gilbert Brown out of the backfield, Mike. A couple of guys you're talking about passing the ball for the Bears. Chris Penn, they picked him up in a trade right when the roster's changed. Number 86, the Bears like what they've seen of him so far. Remember, no Curtis Conway. He's out till about the middle of the season with his shoulder injury from preseason. Speaking of guys who missed about half a season, that's what Robert Brooks missed last year for the Packers and the postseason rung. He was injured on Monday Night Football. He returns tonight on Monday Night Football. Today, there are more than 14 million places throughout the world. The Green Bay Packers were the NFL's dominant team in the 1960s. Bart Starr was the quarterback during those glorious times, and Vince Lombardi was their coach. In football's first Super Bowl, Starr threw two touchdown passes, and Lombardi's Packers were world champions. The Packers won the first Super Bowl, and last January, they won the most recent Super Bowl. Brett Favre, the tough and talented quarterback of the modern-day Packers, threw two touchdown passes, just as Starr had 30 years earlier. It was a breakthrough performance that completed Green Bay's masterpiece season for head coach Mike Holmgren. Barnes Packers are the world champions, but the next Super Bowl is only five months away. I want to win it. I don't want to just sit here saying that we had a chance and should have done it and didn't. So, yeah, I am great. I want to, I want to play as well as I possibly can. I love to win MVPs every year. What player does it? You know, I think that's what, what makes me a, an exciting player to watch. Bart Starr took the Packers to consecutive Super Bowl titles. Now Brett Favre is out to do the same. The Chicago Bears face the Super Bowl champion Green Bay Packers on the season premiere of ABC's Monday Night Football. Again, as the football season kicks off, Cheetos to a rousing opening day overtime win over the Cubs, making them one for one, representing the Volunteer State. They're in Miami today, who also won last week, but it was less than a rousing opener for Dan Marino. The man has thrown for over 51,000 yards, managed to mere 105 yards and 10 for 26 passing against the Colts. A uh, potential hairy situation in Miami. Let's check in with Leslie Visser. Good morning. It's a bit of a mini-drama here, Chris. Dan Marino is still the emotional center of the Miami Dolphins. His place in history is secure. But his job? That is a little less certain. I did talk to Dan about it, and I said, hey, you know, there may be, you know, sometimes when you're not at 100%, either physically or not playing as well as you can play, that I'll put Craig Erickson in there. You know, it's part of football, and, uh, you know, if, and if it comes up where Jimmy chooses to put Craig Erickson in, that's, that's his choice. It's like saying, well, we're going to put Michael Jordan on the bench. You know, we know Dan Marino's going to be there, and, and we're going to prepare for him. Well, I want Dan to be the quarterback. I want him to be the starter. I want him to be a great player. You know, by the same token, I'll do whatever it takes to win ball games. Do you feel you have something to prove, or you just been around too long? And I've, uh, you know, I, I don't have anything to prove. The only thing I have to prove is, is uh, to myself. 
you know what you know what I want to do. I don't have to prove for anybody else. If it's gotten under Dan skin, I, I'd rather not have an, an aggravated or a, a cranky Dan Marino to face. I'll go out and do what I got to do to uh, help this team win, like I do each and every week, like I did for 15 years in a row. So that won't change. Marino knows that Johnson was upset with his erratic performance last week against the Colts. I think the biggest thing is not hurry the throws. Uh, you know, we've got to be able to convert on third down. We only had 11 first downs. We only had 200 yards of offense. For me, you know, I'm hard on myself. So, you know, there were cases when I rushed myself at times, uh, trying to make some things happen somewhat. But, uh, you know, that's last week, and this is this week. So I'll just go from there. Yeah, and the other thing, you know, I mean, we did win the game. So. <laughs> Forgot that. Yeah. Dan Marino, who has never been benched for ineffectiveness, knows he will start this game, but Joe.